Welcome and thank you for joining us for the CME and CE activity entitled Clinical Conversations, Improving the Management and Care of COPD Patients. I'm Dr. Ben Taylor from the Georgia Health Sciences University in Augusta, Georgia. Joining me for today's conversation is Dr. Neil McIntyre, Professor of Medicine at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Welcome. Thanks. In this activity, we will be discussing with Neil many of the challenges that primary care clinicians often encounter when diagnosing and managing patients with COPD. We hope that through this activity, learners will be more confident and better informed about the diagnosis and management of COPD. Neil, why is COPD such an important health issue, and why is there such a recent interest in it? Yeah, Ben, those are important questions because uh, COPD is growing in importance and impact. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This describes a family of diseases with narrowing of the airways. This narrowing comes from uh, chronic inflammation in the airways. It causes airflow obstruction and reduction in the ability to move gas in and out of the lung and interferes with the patient's ability to breathe. COPD is really a growing health problem. It's the third leading cause of death in the United States today, and it has surpassed and still growing uh, the other forms of death in the United States. There are probably over 20 million people with COPD, as estimated by the recent uh, National Health and Nutrition Surveys. So it's a huge, huge problem. People have made estimates that as many as 20% of outpatient visits are for COPD, and 36% of visits to uh, specialists are uh, COPD related. This estimates of cost in the United States is approaching $50 billion. And an important point to realize is that exacerbations of COPD are the single most important driver of these costs. The risk factors for COPD, certainly in the United States, cigarette smoking is the number one factor. It's very unusual to find COPD in a non-smoker. can occur. Some genetic factors can sometimes come into play. But smoking is clearly the number one risk factor for COPD. There are other contributing factors to the symptomatology of COPD, things like air pollution, secondhand smoke, occupational exposures. Um, frequent uh, childhood uh, infections can do this, and socioeconomic status. The important, point, the important point is that COPD is preventable. And again, because cigarette smoking is so critical in the pathogenesis, preventing cigarette smoking and stopping it in people who have COPD is critically important. Now, COP appears to have a variety of clinical patterns or phenotypes. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, that's an important point. Um, we call COPD a disease of the airway, and it sounds like it's a single process, uh, but it's more complicated than that. If the COPD is in the major airways, for instance, you get more cough and phlegm production. In contrast, the airway inflammation is more distal in the lung, you get more small airways dysfunction and dyspnea, alveolar destruction, and what we call emphysema. For many, many years, we had sort of two classical phenotypes the blue bloater and the pink puffer. The blue bloater described the person, again, with airway disease in the big airways with cough and phlegm, and the pink puffer was the patient with more distal emphysematous type uh, patterns of disease. But it's clearly more complicated than that. Future phenotyping is going to require us, I think, to look at things like disease trajectory. How fast are the patients losing their ability to breathe and their pulmonary function? Patterns of exacerbation is a critical component. As I mentioned a moment ago, exacerbations are the single biggest driver of costs in COPD. So patterns that are patterns of disease that are marked by frequent exacerbations are critically important to use in categorization schemes. Systemic effects are important. Uh, this disease we used to think of as just a disease of the airways, but in fact it's an inflammatory process that spills cytokines into the circulation causing injury to other organs. And one of the classic signs of this is the cachexia we see in patients with severe COPD. One of the things I've always been interested in is ventilatory drive. Some patients uh, will slow their ventilation down because of the high work of breathing and retain CO2 and become hypoxemic earlier in the disease, whereas others seem to have an increased drive to breathe and will keep ventilating uh, and working harder to compensate. Very interesting why the ventilatory drives are different. And I think a growing area of categorization and classifications is going to be imaging studies 
uh, going beyond the X-ray and the CT scan, going into things like uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Now, there's, some, there's a such thing called the gold staging system for COPD. Can you explain that for me? Yeah, that's, that's an important question. GOLD is the Global Obstructive Lung Disease Consortium. This is a huge international group of uh, clinicians that uh, meet on a regular basis to discuss issues regarding COPD. And they've been very instrumental in developing a staging system, staging system, and this staging system has been used in research studies, it's used in clinical practice guidelines, it's used for uh, uh, epidemiologic studies. So it's an important, uh, it's an important group and it's important for clinicians to understand how this staging system works. The one that's been around for the, the, the first iterations of this staging system were based on spirometry. We're going to talk more about spirometry later, but spirometry is measuring the flow of gas essentially, or essentially during the first second of exhalation, the forced expiratory volume in the first second. And this is a nice measurement of airflow through the big airways of the lung. And, uh, uh, depending upon how much this is reduced based upon age, height, and gender prediction equations, the goal group describes how severe the COPD is. So for example, if you're above 80% of predicted, we call you stage one. If you're 50 to 80%, we call you stage two. If you're 30 to 50%, we call you stage three. And if you're below 30%, we call you stage four. This is a system that has been around for, as I say, a long time guides clinical practice guidelines and is used in a variety of different ways. As I mentioned before, the classification of COPD needs to be more than just a simple measurement of airflow through the big airways of the lung. For example, the spirometry doesn't measure the small airway function of the lung. So you may have significant COPD, but if it's in the distal airways of the lung, the FEV1 may not be bad at all. So this classification scheme uh, uh, is a bit too simplistic for me, and the goal group recognizes this as well, because there are upcoming guidelines, further developments in the staging system that are going to include dyspnea scores and are going to include uh, this exacerbation tendency. So the future of COPD staging uh, is going to get, I think, probably more complicated, but it's reflecting the disease. Um, I think, for instance, genotyping is the next wave. We're actually going to be able to map certain genetic patterns that predispose to different clinical presentations of COPD. So the next big step in staging, I think, is going to be this genotyping uh, uh, process. So let me sort of summarize, if I may. COPD is a progressive inflammatory disease of the airways. COPD morbidity and mortality is increasing, and along with this, cost to society for COPD are increasing at a rapid rate. Depending upon exposures and host responses, COPD manifestations or phenotypes can be quite variable, can be quite variable. Current staging systems that are based just on FEV1 and spirometry, uh, I think are too simplistic. In future staging systems will include other features of the clinical picture and ultimately, I think, genomics. Thank you, Dr. McIntyre, for this excellent overview. In our next section, we will use a case study to illustrate the best approach to the diagnosis of COPD.